Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and I'm a storyboard artist for television animation, and I also um, do a lot of illustration work. And uh, last week we did, um, or I introduced you to drawing Curious George from a model sheet, and we did this nice little um, drawing of Curious George, and today I'm going to paint it. So this is kind of a, a basic watercolor, um, you know, my standard how I paint with watercolor um, introduction. This is uh, this palette that I have, um, I got from uh, Cheap Joe's uh, Art Supply, I'll put a, a link in the, um, sorry. I'll put a link in the description when we're done. Um, what I'm going to be using today brush-wise is about a th from a 3 to a 0 of, is a, they all flop down. Um, let's see here, this is a uh, number 5, um, Merit uh, uh, De La Rowley. Um, this one is a number 3, Raphael. And then 2 Windsor Newton. Um, one Raphael, uh, I believe this is a, probably another one Windsor Newton, and this is a zero. Um, I'm not sure which one of these brushes I'm going to be using primarily on this particular piece because a lot of times I do four by six, you know, keep it small, and I'll use usually this range of brushes in here, but we've got some larger areas that I want to cover today, so I'll probably go up mm, as high as the three, probably not the five, because I'm not going to do all over the background, but I am going to paint the yellow hat. And this is a rather difficult um, section to paint if I wanted to give it um, a uniform color, because I'm using, this is hot press watercolor paper. Let me lift the lid here so you can see. This is Arches um, watercolor hot press. And they come, it comes in blocks. You can see the edge there. That black is a glue that goes around the edge of the block. So there are 20 sheets of paper here. And that glue keeps the paper stretched. Um, you can buy sheets of paper and cut them down and then tape them down to a board. Is another way to do this with watercolor paper. But I highly recommend you buy legitimate watercolor paper. There are all kinds of companies out there. Arches is a French company. There are Italian. There are um, a lot of uh, um, Eastern European uh, countries that make really nice watercolor paper. Um, I like experimenting with it, but Arches thus far is one of my favorites, and it's easy to get a hold of, and I usually get it from Blick. And a pad like this will run you around, I think, $25 nowadays. So uh, it's um, about a buck to two bucks a sheet. But I think for the, the 9 by 12 it's about um, a buck and a half a sheet, I think, is about what it co costs. But anyways, we're going to get going on this. Um, I use my water. I use my... I have a Ducati. I actually ride a Ducati motorcycle. And I'm, I'm using a teacup. This is a basically... Uh, Ducati teep cup that I just filled with water and my palette here is filled primarily this is Windsor Newton professional watercolor their Cotman watercolor is totally legitimate good stuff um, that's considered their student brand but um, it's really good watercolor um, I like Raphael I like Holbein um, but at the moment I have a tendency to stick to Windsor Newton um, just to let you know, if you see fuzzy hairs in my stuff, I have a cat. Um, if you are an artist with a cat, I defy you to keep your cat's hair out of your watercolor. Okay, we're going to start with a hat just because, number one, um, it's usually good to start with the lighter colors. Um, this is also going to be a little bit difficult because, um, again, it's a large area. And I'm doing a technique that's called um, basically wet on dry. I don't like to get my watercolor paper wet first. I like to use um, uh, wet paint on dry paper. And it's just, there, there are different techniques that you can use to um, make watercolor work. And it, this is the one that I find works best for me. And so what I'm doing here is I'm adding water to the watercolor and then I'm making 
like a puddle of watercolor. And because it's got um, a cohesive bond in the water, that's what causes it to keep together in a puddle in one area. So you don't have to really worry about it going anywhere. Um, but colors will run into each other and you get used to how you play with your, your paint on your palette. But it will stay in a general area because again, the, the cohesive quality of water holds it together. So um, I'm mixing up, we're gonna make it just, this particular color is, um, I believe, a cadmium yellow light. And um, I'm gonna just start at the tip and I take a puddle and I start working it down and I'll work it all in one direction towards me. And hopefully, it, you know, if it dries flat, hey, great, we're good to go. We only have to do this in one blow. Um, but most likely um, we'll have to do paint this yellow two or three times to get a good even flat yellow. We'll see. Um, it, it all depends on how the paint's behaving on any given day. And that's the thing with paint over digital art too is that you can't always count on your paint doing what you want it to do so we'll get that down to here now the nice thing about watercolor is the um the glue in watercolor is called gum arabic it is made from the sap of an acacia tree and um it evaporates as fast as the water evaporates um your paint's dry. So that's one of the reasons why I've always loved watercolor, and I'm gonna start at this end now. While this end's drying here, by the time I get down to this edge, we've got also got this nice black edge with that I've done with ballpoint pen, and that'll keep the boundaries separated, but this will probably be mostly dry by the time I get the paint down to that end. Now, mind you too, um, I've mixed in enough water and possibly enough pigment that maybe, um, I don't have to do this more than once. We'll see. And, and it all depends on how much I've mixed up. So we will see how that goes. At the moment, it's looking good. <laughs> you can't always count on your watercolor to dry without foxing or um, puddles or things the way you don't expect them to go. So one of the things that you do learn as you're doing more watercolor painting is that you learn how to fix your mistakes. Um, and once you learn how to fix your mistakes, then you're not as afraid of making them. And I think that goes with anything in life in general. It's like, I am a big mistake maker. I make mistakes over and over and over again. And um, I try not to but uh, it doesn't always help. So this, you can see, there's a little bit of different uh, areas drying with different colors in this portion of the hat. And since the hat's also, that's under the brim, that might be a good thing, because then we can put another um, color, maybe a little bit of a, a more orangey or a bluish or purplish yellow there to give it our, uh, maybe a light coating of purple over the top of it to give it a little bit of a shadow. So we'll see when we get, you know, once everything dries. When in watercolor too, you want your layering. Um, from what I understand, I haven't done a lot of oil painting. Um, I want to do more of that as um, time goes on in my life. Um, I've been primarily an illustrator and when you're an illustrator, you don't have time to um, allow oil painting to dry. Um, I know that there are some people out there um, who do amazing illustrations in oil, um, but they also ha make dryers. They, they will liver literally make ovens for their paintings so that they can um, dry their paintings faster or get the paintings to dry faster. And they'll often have more than one painting going at any time. So there, lay down our first bit of yellow on the hat. And then uh, now I think I'll work on George. Um, George is gonna be primarily burnt sienna. So that's this, you know, see in the, yeah, you can see barely in the, the corner here. I'm gonna push up my, my palette here a lot. Yeah, there we go. That's burnt sienna in the corner. And I like, I use burnt sienna a lot. Burnt sienna is one of the, if you want your basic brown, um, I find that when you're mixing browns, 
uh, the reason why you want to buy brown side, so burnt sienna and burnt umber and um, raw umber and raw sienna is because um, mixing browns, um, they get muddy. They, they, their color is not, believe it or not, when you're talking brown, brown has some intensity to the color. And if you're using a pur pure burnt sienna, it, it's a nice red. It's, it's a really good, rich earth tone and a great place to start. So if you're going to mix any other kinds of browns, um, uh, burnt sienna is a um, red brown. And then um, uh, raw umber or um, burnt umber are your yellow browns. And sienna has, is again, it's towards the red side, but it's more, um, it's like redder than sepia, which is um, another interesting tone of brown that I like to use. Um, if you've ever um, uh, seen old uh, tintypes, photographs that are tintypes, those are usually considered sepia. Now you can see, I started to two different sides here. Okay, I'm trying to keep a uniform color on George and so I'm trying to um, find a point where I can get together on the brown and try to keep it wet. Um, that's not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna, there's gonna be a division somewhere. This is, so I'm, 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 I'm in a race here to make sure that that puddle stays wet. Um, because the moment your that line dries, that's when you get that edge. That's when you um, get foxing, and that's when you get an edge. So there's a bit of a race sometimes to get from one side of a painting to the other. It's like I'm, I want to keep this edge here wet, so that I don't have a dividing line when it dries. Now, if it does get a dividing line, and, and I'll see, we're, we mo we're bound to have one on this painting because it's larger. Um, ah, we got a little problem right there. I'm allowing a little bit of the brown is seeping into the yellow. And because I didn't let it dry all the way. And it's still doing that. So I'm going to dab it there. And you'll notice it'll, it'll gotten a little bit lighter in the yellow there. And this that part of the hat's going to go darker. So I'm not worried about that. Or I could go for, for the whole thing. Um another layer of yellow if I wanted to. But that way, I, while, I, while I, I sucked out that, that color there, that kept it from bleeding into the yellow. And that's an example of one way that you keep from quote unquote um, making a mistake happen because otherwise the brown would have bled into the yellow, dried there, and there will probably be even a little bit. There looks like there's going to be a little bit there anyways. Um, and then you find, okay, what's another way I can fix that? I made a mistake. How do I fix it? And that's half the challenge of working with watercolor. And once you start working with it for a while, those challenges, once you figure out, oh, geez, that's, that's not that difficult of a, it's like I'm making an edge right here. You can see right there. And I'm going this way because I figure if it dry an edge right there, you won't notice it because of the shape of his body and how things run in that direction. You'll also notice that there's a little bit of, um, there, are, there are fibers on the paper that stick up. It's like you can see them in the wet. You can see little dots. And as the paper dries, those little dots will disappear because the fibers will settle down after the water has adhered to the paper and it dries out or those dots will stay there. And what you have to do is go, okay, that's what the paint is going to do with this paper, with this particular type of paper. And I'm either gonna allow for that and go, okay, that's all right, I don't mind that. Or you go, okay, I'm not real happy with that. And I'm gonna do something to change that um, as I'm painting. And it's like, those little dots here, I don't mind. I mean, it's like, it gives some texture to George. So that's fine with me. Now, if I didn't want that kind of a response on this particular painting and this particular paper, another thing I can do is use liquid acrylic. Um, 
liquid acrylic inks, FW, uh, um, let's see here, uh, Rotring makes one. I think that FW is Rotring, come to think of it. Um, and um, Arrow Color is one of my favorite. Schmincke, or Schmincke, 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 um, makes um, Arrow Color. And they're designed to go through technically airbrushes is what they were originally designed for because they have a very, very, very fine particle base. And they make um, great watercolor for watercolor painting, just like we're doing here. Um, and they're much more transparent. So if you want like um, it to look like a marker, almost a marker type um, finish, but it'll be more permanent than marker. Um, and you paint it in this, almost the same way that you do with watercolor. Um, liquid acrylic works well for that. But then again, um, if you want some texture, then you're not going to get that with the liquid acrylic. And it's like, as the, the burnt sienna is drying, like I said, I mean, it's, it's taking a bit of time to dry here. But it looks like it's going to dry with a little bit of spottiness to it. And I think I'm going to stick with that just because hmm, I kind of like that. And again, with watercolor, you're going to get some of You can see right in here where we pulled up the paint, there's a little bit of foxing there. Not much, but a little. Um, but again, I think I'm going to go over the underside of this with, um, I think a light purple maybe. And then we're going to go in the inside with a darker purple because yellow looks good with purple shadows. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the flowers over here. And what we're doing right now is we're basically we're laying down the basic, um, base colors for everything. And if you were doing an oil painting, um, or um, an acrylic painting, I will probably, I paint them more or less the same way because I, I, I have a tendency, because I learned on watercolor. Okay, I'm switching from, this is the uh, number five is what we've been working with. Um, I'm gonna go down to, um, I'm gonna do a two. Yeah, I'm gonna use my Winsor Newton number two next um, because I'm, I wanna do more delicate areas in here with the green. And that's where we're, where we're going to go next. I'm going to paint the uh, green of the grass and the uh, dandelion leaves there while I'm waiting for George to finish drying up. Now, if I want him to dry faster, if he doesn't get dry by the time we get done with grass, um, I might go into that with um, my blow dryer. I have a... Uh, um, a blow dryer underneath my desk, you know, regular, you know, like we use for blow drying your hair. Um, I have that underneath my desk and I will sometimes hit, um, my watercolors with that just because it's not drying fast enough. Okay. What I'm doing right now, this is, um, a permanent green light and this is a uh, Prussian blue. To, again, a lot of these colors, these are very, very basic colors in my set. Um, I keep a rather limited palette for the most part and try to mix most of my colors. So you can see that it starts out, that, that permanent light is this nice yellow green. And by adding a little bit of um, um, Prussian blue to it, it's going blue like bluegrass in Kentucky. And it gives a, a variance of green. I feel, I feel that um, most grass is not just straight chartreuse. Um, what I like about green in nature is that you always have um, different colors actually in your grass and your trees and your bushes and green's my favorite color. I can't seem to get it, you know, the way I always want, you know, I see the, the green and grass and I love the color in grass and I never can seem to get um, my greens to quite um, go the way I want them. I don't know why that is. But um, it might be the pigment. It might be the, uh, the company. Now, I'm doing these little dots outside the lines here just to give some texture. I find with my, my own watercolors that I like um, adding almost confetti-like dots here and there just because it um, adds interest to the piece, so you're not giving a, a single, um, oh, I don't know. It just, 
like I said, it, it, it just adds interest, makes things look interesting. And then you have different shapes going on. Let's see here. Into the leaves. You can tell, see, it's still rather wet in there, but the hat is totally dry. And that's the other thing. If you do watercolor, you'll, you'll get to the point where you'll start feeling for when your work or your paint is dry and when you can work one color next to another. Um, that's why often, too, beyond the fact that it's good to work all over the painting at different points, um, you, want, you don't want to work one wet area next to another wet area because if you do... Um, you'll have the same problem that I had there where it one one piece will bleed into the other and then you have to fix mistakes um, but like I said a lot of the times with watercolor a lot of your mistakes are not necessarily bad ones sometimes they're they're happy mistakes sometimes they they come out the way you didn't realize that you really wanted them to okay Let's see here. Now the areas um, around his hands and his feet and his face are relatively dry. So I could go there and I think that's what I'm going to do next. Um, George has, you know, um, a human type um, color to his face and hands. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take, this is the uh, burnt sienna again. And I'm going to take just a little bit of, um, this is alizarin crimson. My two reds here, this is a cadmium red pale, and this is alizarin crimson. And alizarin crimson is a pinky color. It's like when it's, when it's, um, trans, or the more water you add to it, it basically can go from pink to maroon, depending on what you want. And what I'm doing is I'm making a puddle of very, very, very light burnt sienna with a hint of alizarin crimson in it just to give it a little bit of pink and my green is seeping into it but it what you'll find out is that green will stay up towards that side of the so yeah nope i'm gonna make a wall there we go so you see how that green was seeping into my my um my skin color over here and i just picked up the my uh, paper towel and dabbed it and then we have a wall of dry between them now, so they want a little bit more. Yeah. Now this might, you know, you can see I'm making this really, really thin, and this might even be too dark. We'll see. Uh, let's try it. Well, it looks like it's going down pretty well. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, if that had gone down too much darker than that, um, I would just blot it. I'm going to let, let it dry on its own, but I'm going to just blot it. Yeah, that's good. That's a good color. And you don't always get it right. Sometimes you get it darker, sometimes you get it lighter. And um, this time, I think I got it just right. Maybe just a little bit more lizard. Because I haven't done his face yet. And his feet. And you can see all the green are down here is dried already. And different colors will dry at um, different rates. And depending how much pigment you have on, uh, in the color when you're painting it, it'll dry faster or slower. And um, if you've ever worked with gouache, gouache is a marvelous. It's very delicate, but it is opaque watercolor. You can get it in um, acrylic gouache nowadays. But what happens with gouache, when you paint with gouache, um, they actually have smell to them. Um, I could swear I could go blind and paint with gouache and know which color I'm using just because they have different scents to them. Um, I used to paint a lot in gouache of all places in college. Um, I went to Art Center College of Design in the 80s, in 1980, around 1980, and um, um, they had us do everything in the first semester with gouache. Nobody uses gouache anymore. It's like they used to have us, um, you'd, you'd do a, a project and you, it would be on paper. We did not have computers at that point. And you'd have to do every project with a paper flap, and there was all kinds of protocol to it for presentation and stuff. And you don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. It's like I feel 
I feel like um, I was living at the last turn of the century instead of this turn of the century sometimes. But uh, um, it's nice to use these tools still. These tools will still be good 100 years from now, 200 years from now. Plus, they're concrete. Um, I like doing digital work. I do do digital work. If you check out my Instagram or my, my website, um, I do a lot of digital work. Um, last illustration project I did was like totally rendered out digital piece. Um, but I still like working with the wet stuff. Um, it's like working with an animal. Um, I don't know. It's, it, there's something very visceral and fun about working with paint. Okay, now, this stuff's all dried out. Now, you notice George is all spotty, okay? And I'm actually, I'm liking that. Um, I'm going to leave that. Um, I might go in, like, right there. Ah, geez, I shouldn't have touched that. It's not dry yet. Ugh. I'll have to go back. But it's like this little piece right there. You'll have schmutz sometimes get into your paint. And it will, um, the pigment will suck up to the, the pieces. Um, I will have to do, I'm going to do, um, next couple weeks here, I'll do a piece with salt. Salt is one of those things and, and bleach and use some uh, some weird techniques that are just plain fun in uh, watercolor because when you add salt it's like you'll paint an area in watercolor and then while it's still damp, not when it's wet, but when it's damp you add salt and then all the pigment like shoots to where every everywhere a salt particle is and then you let it dry and you uh, take the salt off with a knife um, and so it's like like I said um, painting is very visceral it's real and those are the sorts of things that make it fun now I've got two purples I have a violet here and I believe this is a um, oh it's called purple but you'll notice this one is more red and this one's more blue and it's like I can't find a purple that I really like I want something in between that so I'm mixing that kind of up right now and what this is going to do is purple is a complementary color to yellow and one of my favorite um, painting instructors when I was at school was a lady by the name of Judy Crook and this is it doesn't matter whether Judy taught me or not but um, uh, when you paint the shadow of anything um, a color will go into its complement so to make a really nice rich shadow on the underside of the man yellow hat's hat I'm using purple and what will happen is you will see that purple it goes a little bit gray but it still holds the purple too so you'll in various portions of the paper it'll look purpley or gray or yellow all together it'll have like three colors in one and that's a, a, a nice um, attribute of watercolor. Now, if I get this too dark, oops, see, I went over the edge, pick that up with my paper towel and go down again. And you'll notice, all you gotta do is blot it. Don't smear or anything like that, just blot it and it'll suck up the, the accident. Now, there's a little bit of heaviness right here because I had, um, I did some accident with my drawing there and I scraped it away with an exacto knife blade. So the the um, the paint is ad adhering a little bit more into the fibers in that area. And that's okay because you'll notice all the purple is getting a little bit of that foxy um, how shall I say almost felty quality to it right now. And that's a thing that happens with watercolor. And the thing is, is that if you don't like that texture, um, like I said, I would learn to use um, liquid acrylic instead because you won't get that kind of texture with the liquid acrylic. But I like the foxing. I like the, the little bit of jumbly quality that you can get with um, watercolor. Now sometimes it doesn't go the way you want it to and that's when you want to overpaint where you get a really big area that you're not real pleased with. 
but that foxing is going to happen um, just because it lays down pigment and when the certain areas of the paint dry it's going to add that extra pigment now right now you can see just the color as I've got it here is that that color is almost the same color as George and I'm thinking that looks a little bit dark so what I'm going to do I'm going to blot and you'll notice I'm giving texture here and that's okay because that kind of texture is per actually okay with me right now but also that lightened up the purple so we got this nice kind of funky texture going on right now and I still have my purple and we'll see what how that dries um, now I'm gonna go into since George is more or less dry um, I think I want a little bit smaller brush actually. This is a number two. It's a Raphael. I think it's a number two. Let me, nope, one number one. My apologies. Uh, this is number one. Um, and I'm going to add a little bit of brown to that along with the purple. So I want, I'm going to do George here. Get the, get my um, shadows in George. And with the shadows, I'm, I'm doing a core. So the sun, I'm having the sun come from this direction more or less. Technically, he's all under the hat. But I'm going to pretend like we got sun bouncing up this way. Or like he's got it partially tilted up. So I don't know if I'll really push that, the shadow of, of the, the hat on his face. We might haven't decided yet and that's the thing too is like while you're painting that's when you you know I'm I'm not one for making my decisions beforehand you could make a color sketch beforehand some people do that um, I like to make my decisions while I'm painting let's see here there we go and then on his tummy here Because the hat is coming down there and yeah actually more the the lights coming from here actually as I'm starting to paint I'm going nah actually the lights coming more from here isn't it it's like Lynn make your decisions and tell people the right thing okay and what happens is when you put in a shadow a core shadow all of a sudden the figure starts gaining dimension and starts turning so that he you all of a sudden you start feeling the form more so it's always you know fun to put in shadows but you know you're always worried about oh gee am I putting it in the right place and it's like honestly um, I have put shadows in the wrong place and if you look at most things there are usually um, light source comes from a lot of different directions so as long as let's say you're putting all your shadows on the left side or you're putting all your shadows on the right side and you're putting more the more or less underneath your character so that you know usually light comes from above just because we're used to sunlight so as long as you have the light coming from above and from one side or the other yeah pretty well are faking it good and you know nobody's gonna go you did that shadow wrong it's like yeah that's not the point um, you're trying to give some dimension to your character or what have you so you know hey you can occasionally mess up on your shadows you might not do it quite perfect um, but do it and you'll find that that your character all of a sudden stands out more because you took the time to put some shadows in them used to I'm afraid of the dark I come from uh, Arizona initially and everything gets washed out in the light when you're in Arizona it's really tough to understand shadows when your two colors are either brilliant light or complete darkness <laughs> the sunlight just really bleaches out shadows um, I don't know the artists in Ar Ar who live in Arizona will differ from me but uh, 
I'm so glad to live in California now. Okay. We're gonna let that dry. I want to put a shadow underneath him, but um, I'm not ready to do that yet. And I am going to put some real purple into the interior here. And maybe, hmm, do I want to put a little red? Mmm, decisions, decisions. Add a little red. Add a little red to it. Because the red has some pigment in it. Um, your heavier colors, your cads, anything that has cadmium in it, is always going to have heavier pigment in it. Because this is going to go brown on me. I might add a little blue in this after. Once, once the color dries... If this color comes out too much looking like George, um, I'm either going to add some more purple. No, that's more purple right now, since it nicely leaked in there. Um, or I'll add a little blue in there to make sure that it... Or actually, I could put some Payne's Gray. That's what I'll do. Put some Payne's Gray in there. Because it's coming out too brown right now. And that, that uh, secondary purple over the yellow. It's coming out very, very, looks almost the same color as George. So I'm going to blot that away. And I'm going to let that dry. And in the meantime, I'm going to take, I want to put a nice light core shadow down here. And I probably, I probably should have left some reflective light on the edge there. Let's see if I can, see if I can go and blot it out. Hang on. I'm blotting out that edge just a bit. And then I'm going to go and put a little bit more purple on this edge. There. Because I want, I want a little bit of reflective light on the edge there. And then, yeah, I'm finding that, that edge there is a little bit too hard. Now, if I come in with water right now, it's like, ah, I'm such a... Yeah, not too bad. Um, sometimes if you come up in with water too fast... You'll end up with more foxing. What I'm doing right now is I'm scumbling, scumbling that edge a bit because I know it's gonna it's gonna dry hard. So I'm scumbling that edge a bit because I want a softer edge on that shadow. And I'm gonna dab it a bit with a paper towel. Yeah, that's pretty good. And the same thing on this this area where I I. Uh, wanted the reflective light. Mm. Let's see what that does. I've laid a lot of water there and that can you can see how it's all of a sudden it's pushing the pigment in this direction. So I'm gonna kind of scumble that a little bit. There we go. I think that'll do it. I think that'll give me the shadow I want. We'll see. Okay now the inside of this hat here um, like I said, I didn't like the way the purple was going because it looked too much like George. It was too much as George's color. So I'm going to pull out some Payne's Gray. This is Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray, it looks kind of like um, cobalt with black mixed into it. I'm not sure how they make Payne's Gray, but um, it's, a, it's a nice pure color. It's more almost a navy blue. Um like you'd see in a peacoat navy blue. So it's it's um, a nice alternate for black. And I use it quite a bit. And I'm going to use... Yeah, that shadow there is still wet. I'm going to use a little Payne's Gray. Yeah. And this will this will turn the inside of the hat green. Rather than the purple that I originally was going with. And actually, that might pull in um, and be a nice harmonizer to the green on the on the grass. And then what I might do too is I might go after that dries, go in with purple again. Let's see. That, 
that's looking really good right there. That's working. Okay. And I'm going to put a little, again, the shadow on George's face is going to be a little, hmm, I just painted that area. This is what I was talking about when, okay, since we just painted this area here, if I were to paint the shadow on his face right now, might not be a good idea. So let's do the inside of his ears. Putting a little bit of a lizard and crimson on the inside of his ears. And let's see here. I'm going to wait and do the inside of his mouth is purple. throw some a little bit of purple into the shadows down here with the plants we're just about done here as soon as we can get that you can tell the browns are taking its good sweet time to dry but the inside of the hat is already dry so while this this uh, area down here is still a little wet I can I'm gonna put some purple underneath him a shadow. And technically that whole hat is covering him, so the shadow all over here. Also, that, that'll harmonize the purples that we've already got in here. Yeah. Like I said, this area is still wet, and I brushed up against it, but I think the bleeding won't be a big problem. Because I'm also, when, when I'm all done with this, we won't, I won't do it on camera just because it'll, it, it'll take me another probably 45 minutes um, to an hour. I'll go over this whole painting one more time with ballpoint pen. That's the medium that I use to do the lines on it. Um, I will go over the whole thing again in ballpoint pen and that will crisp up the drawing entirely. It'll, it'll have a really, really nice finished look to it. And that little bit of purple dot had too much water in it. So you can tell I used the brush. What I did was I took the water out of the brush and then just touched the area where there was too much water and it acts like a sponge. So if you need to pull water out of an area, that's what you want to do. Okay. Now, I'm thinking I want to paint this entire area over in yellow one more time. And what that'll do is you'll still see that purple coming through but it'll make the hat both darker and more yellow. So I'm going to make, make a big puddle of yellow again. Okay. Pull cat hair out. I'm going to start over here. And all it's going to do is intensify the yellow, but that purple will still come through. And I'll just make it darker. So we still feel like we're underneath the hat, but it'll give it a more intense yellow. And like I said, with cadmium yellow, it's a very heavily, heavily pigmented yellow. Um, and it almost leaves a chalky quality down. So that's why I'm kind of painting up to the edge of the black line, but trying not to paint over it. You'll see where I painted over it. Um, the um, line will have gone gray 
and that's why you're going to go back in after the fact if you do this in, ball, in ballpoint pen or you do this in um, literally pen and ink good old India ink and pen you really do want to go over the painting again and touch it up wherever you have a heavy pigmented area go over it and you'll, you'll just see that the, the whole drawing and painting pops when you do that um, that's why it's, you're not done when the painting's done you go back and you touch things up and then it looks twice as good but you can tell right now you can see how that that darker yellow is coming through and I'm thinking maybe I need to go do I go over it one more time with the purple or what I might do is I might <sighs> hmm. eh. let that dry for a few seconds here I gotta do his face yet so I'm gonna the last thing I do I'm gonna put some shadows on his face and then decide what we want to do the hat and I think we're about done here oh I know what I want to do I want to put a little bit of blue behind him in the sky just to give it a little bit of of interest and contrast um, let me get his face first here though And this is George is a little bit difficult because he's uh, he's got a very round face. So it's kind of you know where where are you going to put those shadows inside of the eye here? So where do you want to give the volume in his face? And again, whenever you paint in watercolor, it always goes down darker than it dries. So usually, there'll, it'll, depending on the color, the one color you always have to worry about is purple. Purple always goes down dark. You really have to worry about purple. And a lot of times, um, you can try to pull up, you know, if you've overpainted a color, made it too dark, you can try going in and um, pulling it up after the fact. Let's give him a nice little red tongue. And that red's a little bit too dark, so I'm going to pull it up. Again, dry brush. Suck it up with the paint. The dry brush. Okay. Now I'm going to go in with um, a little bit of oppression blue. And probably... Hmm, Oh, a little bit of cobalt too, or ultramarine. Ultramarine, yeah. Ultramarine is a little bit to the red side of blue, and my Prussian blue is definitely a green blue. And I like to mix the two um, hues together and let them blend. Um, when I'm doing a sky, I'll, I'll, I'll use both of them. That way, you don't keep it kind of um, uniform colors. Um, are a little bit boring as far as I'm concerned. So I'm gonna, this is uh, the Prussian blue, and I'm making just kind of a puddle. And again, I like to, like I said, I confetti the edges just to add interest. Ah, and we have not quite dry yet, so we've got a little bit of the yellow bleeding into it, which it's okay. It's not what I intended, but it looks okay. I'll put a little bit. And you try, I, I'm doing a varying amount of the blue too. So I can vary. 
And the other thing is to, if you're scanning this into your computer afterwards, if you use a blue sky warning, blue for some reason does not scan well into a computer. Um, what I usually do with most of my pieces after I've scanned them into the computer, I um, adjust the levels. If you have um, Photoshop or um, you can usually actually adjust the levels too on most um, scanners as well. Um, but I will adjust the levels so that um, um, you make sure you can get those blues in and they don't, you know, um, wash out while you're scanning them in. You can see there's a little bit of boxing and funkiness going on there, which is okay. Again, that's one of the reasons why I'm using watercolor over um, liquid acrylic is because I want some of that, that, that funky quality that you can... Now, that's too heavy. That's really too heavy. So, blot it away. And then come in with more water. And that's still a little heavy for me. And of course, it's like the, the the blue. It's like I'm mixing, getting it a little bit under the um, dandelions. That's okay. It just um, whether you want a little bit of the sparkly of the background white coming through, or um, the a little bit of the blue into the yellow will harmonize it a little bit. So whenever you you overpaint in some areas, it's usually not too much of a problem because you end up harmonizing a little bit with your colors. Okay. Back in here. Now I'm looking at the balance and I put in the background the, the distance I've got from here to here and side to side. I'm going to put some more over here because I'm trying to center the composition. Now you notice I put the composition so that George is a little bit over to this side just because I, I'm i not one for totally centered compositions. I like my, my um, stuff a little bit um, off center, but I don't like off balance. So if I want, I'm going to put some more yellow down or some more green down here. Just because I want to make sure that when the composition is done, there we go, so he's a little bit far from the bottom, so I'm going to add a little bit more yellow and green down here. There we go. Once that's dry, I'm going to put a little bit more blue in there too. And actually, I think I'm going to put a few little dots of green up here. One over here, one or two over here. And that's just to pull the interest up in that direction. And the thing is, since we got a little bit of the blue mixed in in here, that, that's fine with me because we've got a little bit of green going on there. And so that we have an all overall mix of harmony with um, the painting where you've got little bits. And the only part that's really brown is George. And I think we're just about done, except for one little thing. It's like, and one more thing. And one of my favorite um, cartoons as a kid, as still is, as a kid, as actually I was an adult, is Jackie Chan, the Jackie Chan Adventures, and they had a character named Uncle. And Uncle would always say, and one more thing, and one more thing, and one more thing. that up just a little bit. Add a little bit of white to the 
there where you see little bits of color you can just take a little water on your brush and say that area is not totally the way you want it and you just scumble a little water in that area and that'll usually fill that in and I think we're done mm, I'm looking at the I'm such a one more thing and one more thing and one more thing. Here. I'm gonna put some more yellow down here. There we go. Just to give it a almost a reflected light quality. And like I said, I mean, those sorts of things, when you add the little bit of extra color here and there, just add some interest to the painting so that it's not like one overall, you know, George isn't one color. And you'll notice, see all the, the way that, that, that the, um, the burnt sienna kind of glommed together and the various um, um, uh, pieces of uh, paper fiber um, give you little dots and stuff. And if for some reason um, you don't really, you find that too heavy, you can take an exacto knife blade after the fact. And if like that piece right there does, bothers you, then scrape it back just a little. Or if these are too heavy in this area here, just take the exacto knife and just, you know, scrape them really, really lightly. And you can get rid of, you know, like that little dot's too dark, or that's a little dark, too dark, and I don't really care for that. Um, most of the, that sort of thing um, is not going to bother anybody but you. Or, okay, we have this little um, area here that got a little bit dark. Go in there with, this is just water on my brush. There's no paint on my brush at the moment. And just go in there, and you can try to adjust it but just scumbling around the brush just a little bit with water, with damp brush. It's not, there's not heavy water in my brush, it's just damp. Or like that, this area down here, that's not the perfect. I'm not sure I like the way that line went. So I'm going to go in there, clean it up a little bit with my brush. I'm going to go in here. Like, I'd like the edge a little sure. And it doesn't always work. You might have to play with it and go back. It's like, okay, I just picked up all that paint and I don't like what I did there. So, I'm going to take this. Now I'm just going to go back in with water, period. That whole area just bothering me. So, I'll go in there. And I'll play with it. And I'll move around the paint. Not until I get more of what I wanted. And then again, there are things that you will see in your painting that after it's done, nobody else is going to see but you because it's bothering you. It's not bothering anybody else. There we go. And when it dries and it's done and... and you can see I'm, I'm going in and I'm moving all the pigment around in that area because I did not like the way it, it dried. So now I'm taking all the pigment that's in that area and I'm also going to, we'll see how that dries. Now what I might have happen here is there might be some fox in here because I did that. And again, you can, you can play around with it a bit and it may work and it may not. And again, it's experimentation. So there, I had a line under there, so I want to lightly get in there with my damp brush. I'm playing with that, and we'll see what that does. But I think that, that'll that'll probably dry out okay. In there, and that's it. That's our painting of George. Um, my name's Lynn Hunter again, L L Y N H U N T E R. Please like the video, subscribe. I do this every week. I, I do sometimes I do paintings, sometimes I do my sketchbook, um, lessons on drawing. Um, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for taking time to watch this. And uh, 
please join me in the next one. Bye-bye.